Ann and Tim and anybody else who's ever been staff here. Thank you all. So our speaker today is Larry Mellenchamp, who is Professor of uh, Biological Sciences at UNC Charlotte. He's also the Director of the UNC Charlotte Botanical Garden. Um, Larry has degrees in Botany and Biology and a PhD from the University of Michigan. His interests include uh, rare and endangered species, uh, native plants of the Carolinas, uh, natural area inventories, as well as carnivorous plants. Uh, he has lectured widely uh, to rock garden groups and other garden organizations around the United States, as well as uh, talk at, at Kirsten Bosch Botanical Garden in Cape Town, South Africa. Mm -hmm. He has also won numerous teaching awards. Uh, he's the author of several books, uh, including one on wildflowers of the Western Bla uh, Great Lakes region. That was co-authored with Fred Case, and some of you know Fred. He wrote the definitive book on uh, trilliums some years ago. He also wrote, uh, Larry also wrote a book on called Bizarre Botanicals about weird and unusual plants for Timber Press. But he's here today to talk about another book he's written called Native Plants of the Southeast, and that's his topic. So please welcome Dr. Larry Melchick. Thank you, Bobby. I'm uh, so pleased to be here. It's always a, a great treat to come to the Raleigh uh, area. And, uh, Yesterday I had even better treat. I was at Plant Delights Nursery and Tony showed me so many native plants that he has, some of which will be coming along online. So uh, we're, we've been in the age of uh, increasing interest in native plants for the past 30 years, and I just see that increasing. So um, I'm pleased to be here today. Tell these pictures are taken in the south. They got bullet holes and all. That. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you today about, you know, there's hundreds of native plants. So I don't know how I pick these. Uh, there's some of my favorites and some of the ones I'm promoting. Some you will know. Some will be new. Hopefully some you will think about. Um, trying to, to include more natives in your garden is a good thing to do. We'll, we'll talk about that. Now, using natives in the home landscape, here's a typical home. I don't know if any of you, this was not taken in, in Raleigh, so you're all are safe. <laughs> but you can see this home probably does not have a single native in the garden. And you can see how well maintained it is. Um, and these uh, kinds of gardens just get better with age. So here's the same <laughs> garden a couple, three years later. You notice it hasn't changed very much. So. Uh, this is not the kind of gardening you should be doing at home. On the other hand, you could have all natives and it still not be nice. These are all native grasses. And I don't know if I would want to live in that house. It's a little bit stark. Uh, so my point is I'm not a purist, so I'm promoting natives just as I would promote the right plant for the right place, try to improve your use of natives. See, I don't have to worry about things like this. This is where I live, and the house is so small, I don't have much room, and so I can't, I can't experiment with natives in my yard. But fortunately, I have worked for 40 years at the UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens. We have seven acres plus for native plants. So uh, I've had the privilege of starting out interested in natives and all these years paying attention to them. So we grow over a thousand species of natives of the Carolinas and a little bit beyond. Uh, herbaceous plants, trees, shrubs, wildflowers, ferns. We have uh, 60 different ferns. Um, uh, so I've had the opportunity to observe all of these. And real good news is we have just completed a new project at the gardens, uh, not even open to the public until tomorrow. So if you're down our way, our new Natives Terrace Garden. This is a small garden specifically designed to show people how to use natives in the home landscape. So we've got a, uh, uh, some walls, some steps, a stream, some rocks. This is a dry... Uh, Zeric rock garden. Um, we have a rain, small rain garden. 
So we're experimenting with unusual southeastern natives, some, some, many of which are beyond the Carolinas, but which do fine here. And I found that this is a unique opportunity. I could not find a single botanical garden anywhere or public garden that purported to have displays of natives in the home landscape setting so you could get ideas <coughs> on how to use natives as foundations, screenings, ground covers, accents, specimen plants, you know, the usual uh, traditional landscaping uses of plants. So we're hoping that we can highlight natives in that way. So come see us when you're down that way. Uh, why use natives? Well, natives go way back to the 1700s. Uh, I was so impressed when I read in a new book on the uh, 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 colonial gardening that uh, as soon as George Washington won the war, he ripped out all of his English and European plants <laughs> and replaced them with natives, white pines, tulip poplars, uh, magnolias, and whatnot as a show of loyalty to the new uh, regime. And uh, so that's what you should do. Rip out all those <laughs> Chinese, Japanese, European <laughs> plants and, and uh, be loyal plant natives. Uh, why use natives, southeastern natives? Well, one is they're better adapted to our heat. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you, uh, many of the northern and, and western plants are not, are not good here in the heat. And you've all lost some plants uh, from heat. Uh, but here's a, a beautiful setting. And not only are these heat tolerant, but they show a sense of a place if you use our local southern natives. It's clearly that this is a house of the south. Uh, live oak tree, uh, uh, palms, fern, every single plant in there is a native of uh, South Carolina, which is where this picture was taken. So natives can help you give a sense of place uh, to your garden. Second reason is uh, natives uh, are, are more appealing to a native insects and birds. Now, birds don't care whether they're hollies, holly berries come from China, Japan, or, or North Carolina. Uh, uh, they eat them equally as well. But some insects require native plants to reproduce. Uh, zebra swallowtails only eat pawpaw. Uh, uh, monarch butterflies only eat our native milkweeds, etc. So according to Doug Tallamy, and I, I agree with his thesis, that you're going to get more uh, involvement in the web of life if you plant more natives in your garden. The third reason for natives, which I think is the most important, they're just interesting. We have a lot of native plants that haven't been discovered yet or promoted yet. Um, uh, and so, uh, therefore, I'm trying to highlight uh, some of the new plants that I've discovered. And uh, you'll, one day you'll see them in Plant Delights Nursery, I guess, along with the things that Tony's discovered. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about Allium Cuthbertii, one of the great uh, uh, onions of this. By the way, on some of the slides you'll see photo by Will Stewart. He was my photographer in this fabulous book, I must say. <laughs> I spent 40 years writing this book, uh, one year at the computer. Uh, and Will Stewart went to the edges of the region to get pictures uh, for this book. And all the great pictures in there are, are, are by him. He's a fabulous uh, amateur uh, major photographer. So I'm going to uh, been uh, trying to decide on a, a theme for approaching talking to you about natives, and I've decided to go through the gardening year uh, and, and use that as a kind of a way of, of, of introducing uh, native plants. And so we we'll start with January, the first uh, month of the gardening year. Uh, winter is not a um, a time to be indoors, not enjoying the garden, but winter is a quiet time. It's a time of rest and dormancy, but there's still things going on out in the garden. And I must say, there are a lot more non-natives that are interesting in the winter time. You've got, in the month of February, January and February, there's, there's probably 25 things that are in bloom, but they're not natives. Our natives are uh, dormant, we used to have pretty cold winters, but there are still some native things to see in the winter. And holly berries would be the classic, your winterberry holly. Uh, this one's called winter red. This is the most common one. 
And as you know, if you grow hollies, you have to have a male and a female holly, cross-pollinate in order to get berries. And winterberry holly requires the male named Southern Gentleman. So if you have a good matched pair you know, uh, that uh, uh, reproduce well, you'll get an abundant crop of berries. In order for those berries to last longer in the winter, you need a male mockingbird to guard your holly plant. He will keep the other birds away. He will keep the cardinals and the blue jays and the birds that would just devour these berries earlier. He'll keep them chased away and he'll eat one or two berries a day. So if you have a male mockingbird, your berries will last longer. If you don't, they'll go away earlier. So put up a little sign that says, Wanted, resident mockingbird, protect Polly, three berries a day, wages. Some of the new, and I noticed they have this out on the uh, plant sale in the parking lot, one of the new hollies that I'm excited about is called Carolina Ruby. It is a Yopon holly selection. It's dwarf. It's evergreen. If you got the right matching of male, you can have abundant berries. I believe this plant was developed by Nursery's Carolinia. And for us, it's proven to be, last winter, for example, when most of our plants in our nursery looked terrible after the eight degrees that we had for three days, the Carolina rubies had every berry and every leaf that were untouched by the cold. So I can suggest that you might consider Carolina ruby holly. It requires shillings as a pollinator. Uh, and then one of the newest little native hollies for foundation planting is called micron. It is a little dwarf holly that grows very slowly. And of course, that's part of the goal is to plant things you don't have to prune. Prune, prune, prune. Uh, there's, there's no need to be out uh, pruning things around your house that much. So plant slow growing conifers and natives that you don't have to prune. This is one of the perfect ones. This is developed by Head Lee Nursery up in upstate South Carolina. Micron. Be watching for it. I don't think it's mainstream yet, but nurseries are producing it. Uh, a plant that uh, I'm very excited about that you hardly see is Shining Fetter Bush. Uh, if you want this, come to our plant sale next month. We will have it. This is being grown by Cure Nursery. It's a native from coastal uh, uh, coastlands. Uh, there it is in the dead of winter, fully evergreen. It can take sun or shade, wet or dry, uh, in or out. All you got to do is plant green side up. In the spring, it has the most beautiful light to dark pink flowers, depending on, on what you get. It's so new, there aren't any selections of it yet, but I expect that will be coming along. Um, uh, uh, if I keep promoting it. But it's a, 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 a great uh, evergreen uh, shrub to think about trying in your garden. Uh, also in the winter, if, uh, these things you see, notice I've picked all snow pictures. You know, we have snow about once every five years now. Uh, so when it snows, I go out and take pictures of everything. This is ostrich fern. These are the winter time fertile fronds that remain in the garden <coughs> after the green leaves have died. I have, I have one of these on the auction over here. I, I tried to bring a selection of these rarer plants that I'm talking about uh, uh, for you all today. The ostrich fern is, can be quite striking in the winter landscape. Uh, its, it's real glory is in the spring when the new fronds, when the new fiddleheads come up. This is a northern fern and up north fiddleheads are collected and eaten uh, as a vegetable. Here in the south, we just let them grow. They make a beautiful symmetrical structure. Of course, in the summer, they make a robust landscape plant. I have to warn you, these spread. Each plant sends out seven runners. Of course, each of them makes seven. So you either need room to let it grow and make a patch, or you need to give a lot of them away. And one final thing. See how wonderful this can be in the landscape. Um, these are nor this is a northern species. It barely tiptoes down into northern Virginia. But we have discovered a heat tolerant strain, and it's sold under two different names. I think I uh, either fanfare, we, we named it fanfare. 
I think other people have named it the king. This is a heat tolerant, and it's the only one that's heat tolerant. If you buy a northern ostrich fern, it'll just melt away in the summer. Uh, so I've tried, I've tried them several times. So be sure you get one of the heat tolerant uh, clones. Okay, February, winter leaves. Not many flowers in February. Uh, it's hard to beat a hexastylus or a heartleaf ginger for winter beauty. These are evergreen leaves. They get better with age. They make a nice clump. Uh, most of the leaves are variegated. Some are more variegated than others. This is hexastylus minor, one of our prettiest ones here in the Piedmont. Also, most of these are Piedmont species as opposed to high mountains or, or outer coastal plain. Um, these all have uh, small, not, not necessarily small, but not so showy, well sometimes they're showy, but the flowers are underneath the leaves, so you have to kind of look down under, underneath to see them. Uh, that's okay. We mostly grow them for the leaves. That's the beauty of in the wintertime. Here's Hexstylus nanaflora. There's its little flowers. Here's its leaves. I just remembered I brought a plant list to hand out. I guess where it is, it's out in the car. <laughs> so, sorry, you all just have to take notes. I only, you all don't know about this, but as you get older, you sometimes forget things. And so I apologize for forgetting that plant list. Uh, the really super uh, hexastylus is speciosa. This comes from Alabama. It has the showiest flowers. They're, they're huge. They're uh, an inch or more across. They're truly showy, and they're worth looking at down underneath the leaves. And then there's a couple of species that are spreaders. This is a famous one called Callaway. Small leaves, but spreads and makes a nice evergreen ground cover in the shade. Now, most of you know Pachysandra, our native Allegheny spurge. If you don't, you're missing out on one of the finest native plants ever, ever uh, created. And it's evergreen, beautiful foliage in the wintertime, spreads slowly, makes a patch, you can even cover a hillside, chokes out weeds. In late winter, it uh, has little white flowers. Uh, believe it or not, it's in the boxwood family. Those flowers look like boxwood flowers up close. It's fragrant. But you want to pick out good ones for their leaves. Their variegated leaves are the, are the real thing for Allegheny spurge. This is a rare plant in the Carolinas. It's more common out in Tennessee and Kentucky. It's perfectly hardy and does great here. It's shade. March, early flowers. Bloodroot, commonest plant in the state probably. Everybody knows it, everybody grows it. Um, you can't have too much of it. We have about an acre of it. Plant some, let it go to seed. Um, as Warren Buffett would say, if you planted one of these in 1965, <laughs> you would now have a million. Because they multiply, they compound. Uh, each plant makes 10 seeds, and each plant makes 10 seeds, and each plant makes 10 seeds. So over the years, you can have a whole acre of this stuff. There's nothing nicer than seeing uh, bloodroot uh, almost mimicking snow in uh, mid to late March, depending on the weather. There's even a double form. Uh, these are not nearly as, as, as lush and spreading, but they're quite charming and they last a little longer because the uh, petal, there's no uh, sexual parts in there to go bad. Uh, the petals stay nice longer. There are other early wildflowers, uh, the oodles of them. I just mentioned here trout lily and spring beauty. These can often bloom in March if you have warm weather. In fact, they typically would. Who knows what our very earliest wildflower to bloom would be? Time's up. Skunk cabbage. Uh, not everybody should grow skunk cabbage. <laughs> They'll often bloom in February, and they do occur here in North Carolina uh, uh, in the middle part of the state. So there are heat tolerant forms available if you have a, a wet place. Uh, of course, mentioning Oconee Bells, it's a classic uh, uh, late uh, winter plant, usually blooms in March. Uh, it's it's um, elusive, it's hard to get established. They need acid soil. Uh, 
so they don't mind a little bit of heat because they come from low elevations, but you've got to keep them moist while they're getting established. Once established, they can take a little bit of drought. But, but they're worth it. There's nothing prettier. Uh, this is uh, my little Oconee Bells. I've nursed along for about 10 years in Charlotte. And they'll double uh, every year if they're happy. They'll send out runners and make a little patch. They need acidic soil. Uh, they grow under rhododendrons. April. Oops, thank you. Uh, I like to watch plants come up, wildflowers coming up, to see the leaves unfurled, see the flowers unfurled, uh, to go out and see the process of growing. And there's nothing better than uh, Uvularia grandiflora, it's a big yellow flowers. And the leaves come out kind of twisted and kind of wrinkled, kind of like a butterfly emerging from her cocoon or her chrysalis. And then you see these wings uh, form themselves out and harden off. So that's the way uh, you can approach uh, many of these early uh, plants coming up. And uvularia will form a nice little colony. It's not a spreader per se, but it will multiply somewhat and drop a few seeds and you can get a little colony going. Of, uh, this beautiful yellow spring flower. Uh, one of my truly favorite spring flowers, even more elusive, is Jeffersonia. The uh, twin leaf. Uh, the flowers come up and last maybe a day if it doesn't rain. So what you're really growing these things for are their leaves. The leaves form a nice matched pair, like butterfly wings, uh, hence the name twin leaf. And what's better than the flower, flower so short-lived, is the seed pod. So these things will make a little seed pod, and these look like a little cookie jar. They open on the front end, they crack open, and then out push these little brown seeds when they get ripe. And each seed has a little bit of hair on the top of it. Uh, a little white stuff there that's the protein bodies called eleosomes. And that's when ants come along and pick up the seeds. They eat those protein bodies and they throw the seeds away. And that's how they get dispersed. So this is really nifty to watch uh, maturing in very early June. Trilliums. Huh? We're in the age of trilliums. Uh, more and more trilliums being propagated. You just look through uh, Plant Delight's catalog and see some of the new trilliums that are coming into cultivation. Uh, the earliest for me to come up and bloom is trillium decumbens. It has beautiful mottled leaves. It sits flat on the ground, has fragrant flowers. Uh, they spread nicely from seed. Then the next one to come up is Trillium decipiens. This can actually come up in February and just sit there. If it freezes, the plant lays over on the ground. When it warms up, it stands back up. Spectacular mottled leaves. This is my candidate for the finest mottling. This leaf looks like an aerial view of the Irish countryside. All the 40 shades of green. That's my late cat, Pearl. Uh, if you have a cat, you know they follow you around the garden hoping you'll scare up some game when you're out digging. Trillium maculatum. This uh, uh, beautiful trillium is kind of rare in the south. Uh, looks sort of like uh, some of the other uh, uh, Cecil trilliums, but the flowers are subtly different, very fragrant, very charming. You'll come to love these trilliums. The more common trillium cuneatum, probably our commonest trillium across the across the region. Uh, there's nothing to sneeze at, and these naturalize very well. So here again, you get a few started, and they'll make seeds, and they'll spread around your garden. And the weirdest one, Trillium uh, staminium, where the petals are uh, spread out and twisted, uh, called the helicopter toad shade. Uh, isn't that strange? The stamens are the showiest part of the flower in there. These also naturalize very well. I show you just, you probably didn't know that snakes attract trilliums uh, to the gardens, but snakes are not very good pollinators. A <laughs> uh, fairly new plant, uh, Fraser sedge, Cymophilus, is an evergreen sedge, grows in the high mountains, but is quite adaptable here in the Piedmont. I've had one for 35 years. It's tenacious. I have it growing in a terrible place, and yet it holds on, grows, and blooms every year. They have very leathery leaves. I have a, a little one I brought uh, this morning. Uh, 
so I would recommend you try this if you like that sort of thing in your woodland garden. Uh, what's unusual about it is the flowers, while they're perfectly good sedge flowers, are, are showy, large and showy, and maybe even insect pollinated. So this is something a little different in the sedge world. May, transition mine. Uh, if you don't know Spigelia marilandica, you need to get one. They're tough, they take drought, uh, they spread from seed in the garden, they attract hummingbirds. They're long blooming. They spread. Here's a, from one original plant that has now spread over 15, 20 years. They make many large clumps. After they bloom, you can cut them back. And they'll flush out again and bloom some more. <coughs> you can actually have some that have bloomed. <coughs> I saw one or two red flowers left in the garden. Uh, very fine plants for light shade. Big leaf magnolia. This is one of our specialty plants that I hardly can open my mouth with. The two things I have to always talk about are pitcher plants and big leaf magnolia. Uh, in the Carolinas, big leaf magnolia is found only in the five counties just west of the Catawba River. So York, Gaston, Lincoln, Catawba, and Iredale. Uh, they were discovered in Lincoln County by Andre Michaud, famous French botanist about 1795. Uh, they also occur in the Midwest, from southern Ohio all the way down to, to Mississippi, to Mobile. Um, uh, but they're great plants because the leaves are so big. Leaves can be up to 40 inches long. Flowers are as big as a dinner plate or bigger. It blooms in May. It's fragrant. It makes a bold statement in the garden. It's the largest leaf and flower in the temperate zone in the world. This makes a beautiful fall uh, seed cone, if you want to call that a cone. Uh, they've just finished seeding. The birds love these. They eat these like M&Ms. Um, so they get, uh, if you want to get some, you have to uh, collect the seed pod, the, the cone-like structure, before it sheds the seeds and let it ripen in your garage uh, and split open. Otherwise, the birds eat all the seeds immediately makes a handsome 20, 25 foot tree with gigantic leaves underneath. It's unbelievable to stand under these. Um, it creates a lot of shade, so other things don't grow well, well under it. But it makes a bold statement in the garden. And in the autumn, you don't rake up the leaves, you gather them up. <laughs> you can use them as uh, dried arrangements. So you can put them around your fireplace. You can uh, stuff mattresses with them. <laughs> or you can just leave them outside. They look like somebody's laundry hanging out the bushes to dry. When they this is what I like to do. Uh, visitors are amazed to see these big leaves just laying out on the vegetation. It's, it's, it's striking. Big leaf magnolia. June. Uh, here's the Allium Cuthbertii again. Um, the outcrop onion. It's our largest native onion that you've never heard of. It grows mostly on granite outcrops. It comes up and then disappears when hot summer comes. Uh, that, that head of little flowers can be as big as a softball. The flowers can be pinkish to whitish to lavenderish. I think one of the key characters is the large green ovary. And I love to plant this right with orange butterfly weed. They come up and bloom together, and I think very, very nice. So be watching for uh, getting seeds. Every, every year I send some seeds of this to the rock garden seed exchange. Uh, so they, that would be a good way to get some. Are they very invasive? No, not invasive at all. Uh, our other native onions, <clears throat> this is the northern nodding onion, and it can be invasive, particularly up north. Here in the south I've not found it to do that. But I would plant this in a prairie. Don't use the word prairie. I would plant this in a meadow or a grassland and let it uh, be on its own. Don't overwater it. And it'll be just, just wonderful in a, in a dry-ish situation. And then the newest onion, which I do not know the current status of how it's getting into cultivation, uh, Allium alleghaniensis. Tony, do you know anything about this? Do, been given some of this to try. Uh, yeah. so this is from the high mountains, um, 
and it's beautiful. It's kind of like nodding onion. Uh, I, I don't know yet how it's going to perform. I've only grown it for one year, and it seems to be doing all right. Uh, so this would be kind of nice if it were to be propagated uh, and, and grow in the garden. Allegheny onion. Uh, I show this purely for inspiration in terms of what happens in late May, early June. The uh, Rocky Shoal spider lily that grows in the Catawba River over south of Charlotte, around Rock Hill, Lancaster County, South Carolina. These, I think, are growable, but not by the average person. And they're so rare, you, you know, I don't know what their status of being grown and propagated is. They grow right out in the river. And if you want a, uh, a, a once in a, not once in a lifetime, because you can go there any, any year you want to, but if you've never gone and seen the Rocky Shoal spider lilies in full bloom, late May, you should go. It's quite a sight there just south of Charlotte. But there are other spider lilies you can grow. This is the upland spider lily, the Hymenocallus occidentalis. It makes a nice clump in a dry-ish upland setting, not necessarily a wetland setting. Uh, they bloom in uh, June and they're uh, very short-lived. Flowers only last one night. What's odd about them is the membrane around the stamens there. That's what hymen of cows. So uh, that's unique to these uh, uh, spider lilies. Other unusual flowers, uh, the genus Pinknea, the Georgia fever tree. This was discovered 200 years ago by uh, John Bartram. It's becoming a little more uh, widely grown. It's unusual. Here's the flower petals, and it's got five sepals, and on some of the flowers, one of those sepals is enlarged into a showy flag to help for attraction. I guess because the flowers were so unshowy, the petals, uh, they had to elicit help from the sepals to make a showy uh, flag. These are, are quite beautiful, and they bloom for several weeks in uh, June. Pretty easy to grow. Uh, it makes a small tree, a really small tree. Uh, they have several of these for sale at the North Carolina Botanical Gardens plant sale where I visited last night. Is it like water? Uh, they can grow in nature. They grow with wet feet and their head and scuff. But I grow them in just ordinary uh, garden soil. And they do just fine. That's true of so many plants. In the wild, they might grow in a swamp. In cultivation, they're quite adaptable to rather ordinary soil. Uh, button bush is strange. Little ball of flowers with pins stuck in it. Um, attracts every butterfly in the neighborhood when they're in bloom in June, July, even into August. They have great fall color. They make a medium sized bush, about uh, four, five, six feet. There's some newer selections out. We're growing one called a sugar bush that stays uh, four feet. Uh, you see, here they are next to a very naturalistic setting of, of water. Now, these things can grow in three feet of water. They don't have to. July. In July, you know, butterflies come and visit your Joe Pie weeds. And that's a sight to behold. They'll come and visit phloxes and many other things. The Joe Pie is the classic uh, butterfly plant. Um, but this is a, a, a new plant for us that I'm, that I'm talking about, seeing if other people have had experiences with it. This is a little bit more of a western plant. This is Rudbeckia subtomentosa, the uh, sweet coneflower. And you see what a beautiful display it has made. It comes from, you know, west of here, but there are a few locations east of the Mississippi, so it counts as a southeastern plant. And I can't say enough about how this plant has performed so well for us out in full sun, uh, a well-drained uh, 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 setting of soil. Uh, you know, too much moisture is not something that prairie plants like. So this kind of thing you would plant where it's well-drained. But it will reward you with two to three months of blooms. Ours are still having their last flowers of the year. I did bring one of these to the auction over here. Uh, this summer we planted our ugly horse mint, uh, Monarda punctata, 
how ugly that flower is. It's all spotted and pink and the stamens stick out. Who would want that in their garden? Uh, but it attracts every interesting insect that exists when this thing is in bloom. It blooms all summer in a dry, well-drained site. So if you want to contribute to the web of life, plant some ugly flowers that insects like. Don't just think about yourself. <laughs> and you will be amazed and entertained at the array of insects that come and visit these flowers. It's something for your children and your grandchildren and uh, your neighbors to come see when these things are in bloom. Look at that beautiful wasp, this big old black uh, mud dauber there. And right along next to them we plant uh, pycnanthemum, the mountain mint. Uh, no plant has a finer minty fragrance of our native plants. No plant is more aggressive in its growth. <laughs> so plant it in dry, don't overwater monarda or mountain mint, and you will get these craziest insects. Here's a fly that looks like a bee. Here's a wasp that looks like a fly. And here's a fly that looks like a little jet plane. <laughs> so you'll get all kinds of neat insects on your, on your flowers that you don't see on other flowers. August, hot, muggy, and boggy. Because this is my favorite time of year. This is bog plant season. In the bogs of coastal Carolina, there's no more miserable place to be in August. Uh, hot and humid and buggy and muggy. <clears throat> but that's when the plants are at their best, so that's what you got to do. So here's a, an in-ground, here's a, a raised bed bog, a uh, foot and a half tall. Here's a dish garden bog with carnivorous plants and uh, other bog plants. Uh, what you need is a peat and sand mixture. Not in water, no. These are not aquatic plants. That's, that's a good question. There's a couple of things about bog plants. They need to be moist 366 days a year, 25 hours a day. They cannot wilt. Uh, second, it needs to be uh, low nutrients. Not sterile, but low nutrient, because they grow in low nutrient acid soils. Um, so those are the two, and, and full sun. You really need full sun for these bog plants. Uh, this is their time of year. Uh, they're just magnificent. Here's a very simple uh, bed made of uh, like a, a railroad tie type thing with a plastic liner. Put your media in there and you keep it, punch some holes in it for drainage. These are not good to just plant around the edge of your pond. They need to be up a little bit on the edge. Moist roots but not wet. Well drained but not you know, wet but well uh, Moist, well-drained, well-aerated. They do not like uh, anaerobic soil. So pitcher plants are among the showiest of the bog plants. There are 11 species in the south and countless hybrids. Uh, I did a lot of hybridizing back in the 80s. Some of those are still around. The most beautiful species, I guess, is the white top pitcher plant, shown here, Saracenia leucophila. And it attracts all kinds of insects big ones and little ones, uh, and they'll eat anything from a bumblebee down to a ladybug, whatever will fall in. The bumblebees are pretty good about uh, not falling in. They can hold on real well and come for nectar and then they, they leave. But occasionally they'll fall in and they'll chew their way out so you'll see a <laughs> hole in the side of the picture. Sometimes they get caught. Uh, what's amazing is the white top pitcher plant is attractive to moths. That's their favorite food. Even though they'll eat anything, their favorite food is moths. And we've always wondered why the white top, why these uh, beautiful white tops. And the way we found out what they were, of course, was to go out at night and look at what was flying around. If you go out on a moon, a full moon night into the pitcher plant bogs, you will see why these things are attracted to moths. They're like candles in the moonlight an enhanced picture of moonlight reflecting off of white top pitcher plants. And this time of year when these things are leafing, they get full of moths. In fact, they get too many moths in them. They get overstuffed with moths. Sometimes they put cotton down in the, in the mouth just to keep so many moths from clogging it up. And that's what they attract. And these pitchers are very effective at catching insects. This is if you split open a pitcher plant, you'll see the year's catch. Uh, down inside there. It can't spit anything out. 
it digests the insects, and then when the pitchers fall over in the winter, it returns all that nutrients back to the soil, uh, mm -hmm. even even after absorbing from them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because this uh, <coughs> pitcher plant is so effective at catching things, sometimes you will find this system exploited in nature. You might have <laughs> Sitting in there, maybe he's getting out of the sun. He knows that insects come there. So this is like the mugger hanging around outside the bank. <laughs> Just waiting for you to come out with your bag of it. And, and this is not all so bad for the pitcher because he's leaving a little bit of a deposit there in the pitcher plant. That gives the pitcher plant a reward for its trouble. So you can grow these carnivorous plants in a dish garden uh, if you don't have space for a big bed, uh, a small 14-inch bowl with peat, sand, pitcher plant, sundew, Venus flytrap, butterwort. Venus flytrap is the most famous of the carnivorous plants. Easy to grow outside. It's not a good house plant. Outside in the sun, keep it wet. Uh, a lot of children buy these, and I, and I stand there and look at them in the eye and say, keep it outside and keep it wet. That's the only two things don't feed it hamburger. <laughs> Go catch real insects for it. Flies, yellow jackets, uh, cut worms up. They'll eat slugs. Any real food for your Venus flytrap. The more you feed it, the more they grow. And as you know, flytraps uh, have little trigger hairs down inside the trap. There's three trigger hairs on each side. When an insect comes visiting the trap looking for the nectar that's in there, and they touch those trigger hairs, the trap snaps shut, catch the insect nine times out of ten, and it closes up tighter, and tighter, and tighter, squeezes the insect, it secretes digestive juice, it even drools digestive juice. So you know that it's happy. And after a week, it opens back up, and there's the dead husk of the insect down. Also grow these with sundews. Sundews have sticky hairs on the leaves. They catch all kinds of little insects on those hairs. They beautifully glisten in the light. So uh, grow these things where you can see the morning sun glistening off of them uh, in your little dish garden. Uh, with the carnivorous plants, our other bog plants, our native orange milkwort, it is an indicator of Venus flytraps. If you're driving down the coast, um, out in the countryside where it's a wet, sandy pine lands, and you see these orange milkworts, stop and look for Venus flytraps, because this is an indicator of the right habitat. They grow very well in the bog garden. We've learned that these are biennials. So you have to buy one, let it bloom, let it drop seed, and let the seedlings come up, because your original plant's going to die away. So think of them as a biennial. Uh, nothing more beautiful than uh, sebaceas, the marsh pinks. Uh, there's two or three species of these that grow real well in your bog garden. They bloom in midsummer on uh, tall stalks, one to two feet high, depending on the species. Bloom for a month. Beautiful pink. Inch across. A new bog plant that I've uh, introduced. Um, the grass leaf Barbara's buttons. I do not know why it's called Barbara's Buttons. The Marshallia graminifolia is a nice clump forming, foot and a half tall, blooms for a month and a half in the middle of the uh, middle to late summer. It usually does not start until late July or August. Very fragrant, very beautiful. Barbara's Buttons. I think I have one of these on the auction. Uh, very easy to grow and, and, and multiply. And pine lily. This is another new plant I've experimented with. You can grow these. We have grown these from seed to blooming in as little as a year. That's unheard of for a lily. Uh, I wouldn't count on that, but two years you should be able to get these to bloom. The point is they're, they're, come, they're, they're, they're going to be available. They're coming along. Um, you'd be looking for them. They're wonderful to grow. Like most lilies, they're short-lived. That is the flowers. They only have one, maybe the most two flowers per stem. They last a week, week and a half. But they're so good, they're worth waiting for, they're worth donating space to in your, in your bog garden. So, 
create a bog garden, a dish garden, a big garden, a big box, an old bathtub, uh, the back of your pickup truck, anything that can hold some a little extra moisture can be adapted for a bog garden. You mentioned Saracena need fairly low nutrient soil. Is yes. that true for other bog plants? Yes, all bog plants. Now, that's a good, good question. The non-carnivorous plants, pitcher plants, sundews, Venus flytrap, <coughs> Uh, don't want much nutrition at all. The other plants would like a little bit of nutrition. Not nearly what you would give a petunia or a marigold, but a little bit of extra nutrition. So you could fertilize, uh, you could put a teaspoon per gallon of fertilizer on them a couple of times, and that would enhance them a little bit. Uh, fly traps don't want any. What I've done is I use organic pond water. That is, I get water out of a fish pond where there's fish and turtles and other critters live, and you've got some nutrients in there at a low level. If you put that on your bog garden, you will see a big difference than if you just use city water or rainwater. So that little bit of organic nutrients from the pond uh, is definitely uh, enhances them. And that, little, and that little guy will survive in the winter. Oh yes, all of these, all these plants grow outdoors in North, they're all from North Carolina. They're all from coastal North Carolina. They'll all live outside. They've all been down to minus six degrees. The only thing is you can't let them dry out. So if you have a long dry spell in the winter, you might need water. That's rare. Well, they're perfectly hardy. So uh, here's a, I'm not even sure I wanted to show you this, but I, uh, I couldn't decide to take it out, so I left it in. This is a rare uh, wild plant, not in cultivation yet. You should be watching for it. The woodland, uh, uh, broadleaf tick seed, Coreopsis latifolia, is in full bloom in the shade in August. How many plants can do that? In full bloom in the shade in August. Now, these are not gigantic sunflower flowers, but they're respectable. They make a nice big clump, so you should be watching for these. Um, and uh, I'm sure that over the next few years, as these get out and about, somebody will select some larger and larger and larger ones. Uh, so you'll be seeing uh, more of this hopefully coming along. Broadleaf tick seed. These come from the low mountains of the Carolinas. So up to 2,000 feet up around Chimney Rock uh, Park down to Sassafras Mountain in South Carolina. September, gotten a little cooler. Uh, one of my favorite plants of all times, I guess, <coughs> The one that if I didn't have one, I would be seeking it, is our native monk's hood, uh, Aconitum. Monk's hood is a mountain plant. Uh, it grows as a vine. It's kind of hard to tell here, but it's growing up with this honeysuckle and uh, blooming at the tips of these long semi-vines. Uh, it's not a high-climbing or a, a strangling vine, more of a scrambler. Uh, uh, and this is a heat tolerant form that I uh, got from e Emily Allen years ago. This just thrived in, in my garden. And I love it when it blooms in the fall with the orange impatience. <coughs> so this is my favorite scene. It's like ice cream. <laughs> my favorite scene is the purple thick uh, monk's hood and the orange impatience. I like to see those coming up together. And the impatience are uh, just the perfect thing for the, for the monk's hood to grow on. I have one of these that I brought today from the auction. Our native monks, white heat color. Uh, as far as vines go, another vine not in cultivation, but coming along. This is our native magnolia vine, uh, very rare throughout this region, more common over in the mid southeast, you know, Alabama, Mississippi. Um, high climbing vine, not evergreen, makes beautiful candy apple red fruits. I have white ice cream, speaking of ice cream, a white ice cream container over here with fruits of these, and you all are welcome to have some. I brought some envelopes, you can put a few fruits, clean the seeds out, uh, plant them, they need cold stratification, they'll germinate uh, next spring. I also have one plant of this. In the summertime, they bloom with the most red, uh, carbon red flowers. Um, and here's another picture of the carmine red flower. And this is its range. What's unusual is this, this funny little arrow. Uh, about five years ago, we discovered a population right there, 
just west of Charlotte uh, in Belmont, North Carolina. It's the woods full of it, way beyond its nearest uh, uh, range. Um, and, and, and so that's amazing when, when botanists discover things like this. Um, uh, it brings joy to know that there are native plants lurking about out there that we don't know about yet. And uh, we need to go discover them. Uh, in our uh, Zurich uh, rock garden, we're calling it the Southern Zurich Rock Garden. We can't grow alpines, it's too hot. Uh, but we can grow other things that like well-drained, stay small, grow in a rock garden setting. So very sandy soil, full sun, no extra water. And I mean no water at all, hardly <coughs> except just to get them established. Uh, and dwarf plants. These, are, uh, these can be magnificent in bloom, our native Gaylardia. It grows on sand dunes, for Pete's sake. What could be better in a no-water situation for trying to save water? Blooms all summer. A clinopodium, coccinium, the scarlet cat, uh, calamina. Blooms all summer. These big two-inch long red flowers. Hummingbirds love them. And then the uh, various Georgia mints. This is a uh, clinopodium georgianum. Uh, I mean, uh, Georgia rosemary, it's called. Uh, and there's uh, conradina verticillata. There's several other conradinas uh, from Florida. Um, made beautiful, uh, small leaved, whitish, grayish plants in these Zurich rock gardens. Uh, I was very impressed with, with uh, Tony Avent's plants of these, several of these uh, uh, conradinas that, that he grows are, are, are beautiful. We need to grow these more. We, need, we like rock gardens. You're a rock garden society, for Pete's sake. Mm. Since you can't grow alpines, you should adapt our native southeastern plants so that you create a rock garden that people might not even tell from an alpine garden if they didn't know. I challenge you to do that. This time of year is one of my favorite fall flowers, costelest. Costel, costel, seashore mallow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, comes into bloom with vivid uh, pink magenta flowers of several different shades. Uh, you can get a pure white form that I think is quite elegant. Uh, blooms this time of year gets about three feet tall. Uh, butterflies love it. It's a showstopper, really. More people have stopped by my house to ask, what is that flower? Because it's blooming at a time when the rest of the garden plants look terrible, late, late August. Uh, no wonder Congress gets out of session in August. It's just a miserable time uh, here in the southeast. Most of the garden plants have finished blooming. And so looking for something that only, that only comes into bloom then is a good thing. October. Um, this is time for fall fruits and berries of all kinds. I could talk all day about, uh, about fruits and berries that are planted for the birds. But I just mentioned Aronia arbutifolia, the red chokeberry, has the reddest of red berries, and these last through the winter. It's got the reddest of red foliage, the reddest of red winter buds. It, it's really a, a great four-season plant because of what it does throughout the year. And those same berries, if they're not eaten, will still be there in the spring when it blooms. And so uh, 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 for birds and bees and butterflies too, uh, try planting Aronia. Needs full sun to do well. One of my favorite plants I'm promoting more is the, uh, these are hard to find, pond cypress. Nobody has a yard big enough for a ball cypress. They get big as this room. No, not quite. They get too big for a normal yard. But pond cypress is very compact. Uh, not so much slower growing, just more compact. They can grow in ordinary soil, and their leaves are more needle-like and not feathery like, like ball cypress. So they're a nifty plant to, to have in the garden, and they have fabulous fall color. So if you're lucky enough to live on a, on a pond cypress pond like this down in upstate South Carolina, it's a magical place see a stand of pond cypress in fall color um, in October when it's cool and no bugs you can enjoy everything. November, last chance for something. Fall colors in full force. This is our native chalk maple, a small sugar maple relative that grows in Piedmont from Virginia down through Georgia and Alabama. It grows in less acid soils. 
intensely colored. It would be a substitute for a Japanese maple. Similar stature, similar behavior uh, in the garden. Um, you can tell it, here's chalk maple. The leaves are green underneath instead of whitish like our southern sugar maple. Here's red maple and there's striped maple. The sugar, our chalk maple is distinctive and it's, a, it's available, not widely, but it's worth seeking out. I have a little one over here on the, on the table. But the unique thing is, is they, they don't even think of turning colors until November. So you get a late color burst and intense uh, reds and oranges, a little bit of yellow. So definitely something to extend the fall color season. Chalk maple. They don't get too big. Uh, Ample aster, Carolinian. It used to be just aster, uh, Carolinian. It's the climbing aster. Uh, these for us bloom in November. And they cannot hold themselves up. They're a, a vine that does not twine. It doesn't have roots. It doesn't uh, have tendrils. So it has to grow up through other plants. So here it is planted on one of these uh, Oh, so, so Japanese plants aren't so useless after all. So <laughs> Japanese, <laughs> Japanese holly. You can use it as a, uh, a trellis for your uh, Carolina climbing aster. And uh, it's worth waiting for and having it out on your back deck where you can see it fall. Late fall. December. Um, fall color of our native Croton alabamensis. Much underutilized, unappreciated, underpropagated, underavailable, underknown <laughs> native plant. It has unique orange fall color. About half of the leaves fall off. The rest are evergreen. Uh, in the late winter, it blooms with blue yellow flowers in, in March. Uh, it grows only in Alabama, although I think there's now a, a, a location in Georgia for this. And it makes a scraggly, wild shrub out on rocky limestone hillsides where I first discovered it years ago. You might want one of these in your backyard. <laughs> no, I don't mean a Komodo dragon. I mean a needle palm. Our native needle palm that grows from South Carolina on south into Florida. Rapidophyllum hystrix. There it is in the wild. It doesn't get very big up, up north. Down in Florida, it grows into small trees. But up north, a 30-year-old one is uh, 12 so feet high. Magnificent palm in a woodland setting. Strange. Not a single leaf was hurt by the coldest winters that we've had. Down to minus 6 degrees has not hurt it. Last winter didn't hurt it. Snow doesn't hurt it. It lays down and it stands back up. Uh, so I suggest you consider of all the palms, needle palms. These are available, believe it or not, at Home Depot, along with their other palms. Get one for $25, a big one. You've got to watch out for the needles. These are one foot long needles that are sharp as anything nature produces. And why would you need needles like that around the base of your palm? Well, to keep bears from eating the fruits before they're ripe. Okay? So, Warn your bears about this when you plant one. <laughs> Don't stick your hand down in there without knowing about it. All right, the last plant is a native Florida torreya, torreya taxifolia. A plant you wouldn't think would grow into a magnificent garden specimen, but here's a 25 year old torreya. These are practically extinct in the wild, there are a few left. It's probably the oldest plant in North America. In terms of geologic time. Its closest relatives are California and China, the other uh, Toreas and, and Cephalotaxis. There's our magnificent plant with no blemishes. Down on this one limb down here, it makes uh, some seeds. It has a, a, a dark green foliage. If you crush it, it smells, it has a distinctive smell. Hence, one of its name is stinking cedar. But uh, we don't call it that, we call it Florida Torreya. <laughs> those stinking cedars. And there is its seeds. They're about the size of uh, very, very, very large um, hmm, 
stinking cedar seeds. Uh, they're bigger than grapes, smaller than eggs. Um, I don't know what size they are, uh, but they turn purple and they are interesting to see. So I, so I recommend you consider that if you like pot plants. So what are you going to do now? You're going to go buy some plants, <coughs> some plant sale, uh, support your local botanical garden, your local arboretum, your local rare plant nursery, keep them strong, join the Native Plant Society, spread the word, keep it strong. And by doing all of these things, you'll keep us nurserymen and plants people and botanists and horticulturists interested in keeping on uh, bringing these things to, to, uh, to your attention. And that's your garden. So that's the end. <laughs> Any questions that might not have? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, there's one going on out here on <laughs> the pavement. There's one at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. And we have one in Charlotte, October uh, weekend of the 18th. Charlotte, Duke. Charlotte North Carolina. The North Car uh, the North Car uh, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Sorry, UNCC Botanical Garden. Our email is. Uh, Gardens.uncc.edu, or just type in Charlotte Botanical Gardens. Yes, ma'am. Would it be possible for you to send your plant list to somebody and they can throw it out there on email? Man, what, what plant list? Oh, the one I made up. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure, or I can run out to the car and get them. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry I forgot that. Okay, before we take questions, I just want to remind you, Larry does have a book or two over there for sale. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen my native plant book, it's, it's wonderful. I, I sit and read it, um, I have one in every room. <laughs> out in the car. I highly recommend it. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who brought it out there, but I, I'm just interpreting nature and I'm uh, interpreting my observations of 40 years of growing them and knowing them and showing them and uh, dealing with them. And, and, uh, so this, is the, it's the, this issue has come of age now of uh, um, more natives that have been evaluated um, for the landscape. We want to take a couple of questions and then we want to go to the auction. But I also want to remind you, don't forget your surveys. You can leave them on the chair or put them in a little basket over there if you want to find them. Other questions for Larry? Thank you all for coming today. I know you could have been out in your garden, but I appreciate you coming.